All right, with all that frivolity out of the way, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for today, uh, retired General Tom Ayers, who will present on commercial space and the United States military. General Ayers is the Chief Legal Officer and General Counsel for Voyager Space. He is a retired Army Major General, having served over 33 years on active duty, most prominently as the Deputy Judge Advocate General for the US Army. In civilian life, General Air served as the 20th General Counsel for the Department of the Air Force, and in that role also became the first General Counsel for the US Space Force. General Ayers is a distinguished graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point and earned his Juris Doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Richard, I'm going to go with this. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks very much for that kind intro. Probably the best thing I could do after an intro like this is to say thanks and goodbye. But uh, no, you, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was telling somebody yesterday we had Lori and she brought up all the, the friction points of the law. I'd like to say I'm the antidote antidote to a really substantive uh, lecture. Uh, my, my plan is just to tell a lot of stories and, and do things like that. Uh, and, and hopefully throw a lot of things against the wall and maybe some of it make you think and some of it will, uh, will stick to you. Um, okay, so, you know, this title, it's not, a, it's not a small title, it's kind of a big title. And so I, I also thought I can go anywhere I want to go with this title. But I thought first what I should do um, is tell you a little bit of Voyager Space, because Voyager Space is a company you've never heard of. A lot of people have asked me about it. So Voyager Space, we're a startup. We're only about three years old. We bought uh, six companies. One of those companies has these uh, two other subsidiaries. Um, and our idea is to vertically and horizontally integrate these companies to do two things. One, space technology. So you have companies like VTS that does propulsion and SIGIN. Um, you have uh, Space Micro who does space radios and ISR capabilities and, and cameras. Um, and so they're, they're somewhat defense contractors. Um, but then you also have a company like Nanorax. It's not just a space technology company, but it's a space infrastructure company. So they have the, we have the only private real estate on the International Space Station now, the Bishop Airlock. It's an airlock that's bigger than me if I put my arms out, you know, and uh, it can open up and send satellites out. And it can, um, it, it can also uh, get rid of the garbage for the ISS, which is good, and, and in a responsible way, send it out to the atmosphere to burn up. And, but it's also, we've got uh, part of, there were 12 competitors to replace the International Space Station with a commercial space station, and Blue Origin and Northrop Grumman and Nanorax uh, won those contracts, so those three. So we've all while working on a replacement of the International Space Station with a, a late 2028 launch. So I'll talk some more about that, but I just wanted to briefly uh, give you an idea who Voyager Space is and what we are, uh, and happy to take questions about that uh, at the end. Okay, so here's the things I'm, I'm going to cover, or I think I'm going to cover, and again, I, what I'll try to do is tell you uh, quite a few stories. Part of the fact is that uh, I, I, I've got a lot of stories because I know I'm old, right? <laughs> so... Um, when I was in active duty and I was a general officer and I was at the commissary and I was checking out in the commissary and, you know, there's one of those baggers. And if you've ever been to the commissary, you know, the bagger I'm talking about, that's got like the Vietnam veteran hat and all the pins on it. And he just looks like he's a million years old. And, and, you know, I don't want to give this guy a good tip because he's an old Vietnam veteran, but you know, as, as you, the, the cashier says, can we see, can I see your ID card? And, and I always, I flash it and I wanted to flash it quick because I want to give him a good tip. But if you knew as a general officer, it'd have to be a really good tip. So I didn't want to go there. <laughs> so I flashed real quick. But then the guy says to me, he says, you're still active duty. And I was like, oh my God. I said, I'm standing here, buddy. Come on. <laughs> so, uh, so I was old when I was active duty. And then as you heard, you know, I, I, I retired, I did some things, then I became the general counsel. And then I, after I did that for three years, uh, I did some other things. And now I've been at Voyager Space for a year and a half. So, so I'm like old three times over. So I've got lots of stories. I hope I'll, I'll be able to tell some of them that, will, uh, um, that you'll relate to and it'll be kind of following this agenda. So you'll kind of know where we are uh, by the headings as we get to them. So uh, it, now I also know how many people here 
are coming in from out of town and not on the front range. Okay, how many, you could like leave your hands up if you have the altitude headache this morning, right? <laughs> and, and then the, the scratchy eyes from the really dry thing. So if some of you start to fall asleep, that's okay. If you start to roll your eyes or go like this, then I'll, I'll, I'll stop with my stories and try to move a little quicker. Uh, okay, so again, to, to prove um, uh, I'm really old, uh, yesterday, this is a picture from Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Uh, and, and yesterday, I think, Chris, you called it ancient history. Uh, and so, and, and, and I think about the fact uh, I was a third year, um, going into my third year of law school. I was a funded legal education guy. And, um, and so when Saddam invaded and we were going to get a coalition and, and, and push them out, of course, I called student attachment and said, hey, I, I think I was a pretty good infantryman. Can I help? Because one of my reserve classmates in law school just got recalled. He can't do his third year of law school. And they said, you know, I was really kind of afraid. They said, actually, you were a pretty mediocre infantryman. <laughs> but what they said instead was, uh, thankfully, they said, no, we've already paid your tuition. You're staying. We'll call up reservists, but active duty, you're staying in law school. So um, so I was not there in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. But I bring it up because, you know, this is where uh, space implications in our military really started, right? So in 1978, we launched the first GPS satellite, uh, the Air Force does. And, um, and it's really here, it does, it does a storm where the rest of the world recognizes the way that we do military operations is different now, right? It is, it is powered by space, it is powered by precision um, guided munitions, and it is powered by the ability to know where you are on a battlefield. So in Desert Shield Desert Storm, we had pluggers, you know, you had this big piece of equipment that told you where you were, but that was a huge advantage. You know, we didn't have this little phone yet, um, but you had a plugger. And so everybody took notice. And so it was not until, um, you, you know, a little bit later on that other countries recognized, all right, we're relying upon this technology. We've got to have our own. So it was mentioned Galileo, the Europeans, uh, the Chinese now have their own GPS constellation called Bido. And of course, the Russians have their own called Glasnost. So you've got different GPS. You know, we've got the blue dot. I, I assume their dot is red. I don't know what, what it is. Maybe it's pink. I hope it's pink. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and of course, at some point in, in the 90s too, Congress said, Air Force, you have a responsibility to keep this dot going for commercial because by then ATM transactions, farmers, everybody is relying upon the dot. So the Air Force, you've got to keep it not only for uh, for military purposes, but you got to keep it there for commercial purposes as well. And the um, the other interesting thing about that that now is so there's like 38 of these satellites. At least when I was General College Air Force, I think there were 38 satellites. We had just launched the GPS 3F constellation. A little bit more encryption, a little bit more uh, specificity on how good the uh, GPS dot, how precise it would be. And, and there's really only 40 people kind of running that whole GPS constellation out in GEO. So, so interesting. Um, all right. What else do I want to say about that? All right. So, so that, that's my experience. And I'm, uh, um, you know, 1991, I get out of law school, uh, did a lot of things in the Army. I was at a unit at, at Fort Stewart that uh, after Black Hawk Down happened, sent out, sent out folks to to uh, Mogadishu to, to try to plus them up. Of course, they want to send the lawyer. Everybody wanted to go, right? Everyone was going to, I didn't get to go to uh, Somalia, didn't get to go to the Balkans. And then of course, 9-11 happens and kind of everything changes, right? And so obviously in um, 1989, when the wall falls, when Desert Steel, Desert Storms happen, we're kind of a unipolar power. Um, we could kind of go anywhere, do anything in, in terms of, and, you know, General Goldfin used to say, we're, we, we become Goliath, right? We are the big guy. We can stomp in anywhere, do whatever we want. We still obviously have threats, but in terms of air superiority, space superiority, we, we are the big guy, right? Um, and so <laughs> 18 years I'd been in the army and had never been deployed to combat. So I was uh, the, the lawyer for a three-star headquarters. General McChrystal was a one-star at the time. And, and I was flying into Bagram with General McChrystal as we were setting up the first three-star headquarters. And I was getting ready to be the, 
the two star SJA. And so that's just great getting to go to a combat zone. And, and, and of course, we're going into Bagram and C 130 and we're corkscrewing in because there's air defense and they're telling us that. And you're going to go in at two in the morning and the lights are going to be out. And, uh, you know, they said when we get on the ground, you know, the Air Force guys are very serious about us. There's 30 seconds to 60 seconds. We want to be on the ground. Everyone's got to get it off. We've got to get our stuff on. And, and we land in the dark and they, they, as soon as we land, you know, everyone's trying to get out quick and they bring up these big lights and the, the, uh, the pallets are getting on and off. And, and as we're getting off, someone's yelling at us, don't stand, get in the grass, don't get in the grass or the dirt because it's still mine. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is real. I'm finally in a combat zone. And, and, and then the Baltimore Ravens cheerleaders uh, started to <laughs> get on the, <laughs> the C-130. So this is like April of 2002. So I thought, well, maybe it's not such a dangerous combat zone after all. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we did there, that my first interaction with, with, with space technology was we would go out into, and sometimes as JAG, we would go out into these little villages, and this is a picture, the captain of mine going out into a village, uh, they'd gone into a village and found a bunch of weapons, exploded the weapons, and so we needed to go out there and do claims. So it was called Team Village, we all flew out in a big CH-47, and um, the, there was medical people to look at the little kids. There was uh, civil affairs people giving out school supplies. Uh, there was a little generator that um, you, know, you, you wound up this generator as a TV and there was a little presentation that showed 9-11 and said, uh, showed the planes going into the buildings. And uh, as uh, you know, and then it explained that there are foreigners in your country who did this. And once we, we get those foreigners, you know, we're gonna, we're, we're going to leave and uh, leave you back to your country. Well, it was a good story at the time. Very good story at the time. <laughs> but uh, as Jags, again, we were playing claims. And, and then uh, one time we were inserted in one village and we had to, you know, go about, um, about a 15-minute walk to another village. And, of course, we had these guys with these little sat satellite um, radios because you know we had radios. We could talk to a Apache that was flying overhead, but you could also now, they flip out these little satellite things and thought, wow, what cool technology. So that's in in, uh, um, in 02 and 03. Well, so, and this will relate to some other things. So I'm in Afghanistan until from April uh, of 02 until January 03. What happens in the meantime is the invasion of Iraq is kind of spooling up and they, they do what's called in the army a rock drill. Um, and it's, you know, they, it, they, they look at how the invasion would play out, right? And as they did the first big rock drill um, on that invasion, they recognized that the Marines going up one side, and the Army going up the other side, um, it, you know, it's going to take the ground units a while to get to Baghdad. And they worried about catastrophic success, they called it. They said, you know, the idea was that you have to kill Saddam Hussein, right? If you kill him in the first night of bombing with our precision guided munitions, then um, there might be a wave of people who are really happy we're there and we'll need to get a headquarters into, into, ba into um, Baghdad really quickly. So we're, we, you know, we're sitting in Afghanistan, we're get, getting ready to be done with our, our tour and we're told uh, we need to have our headquarters go to Kuwait um, because we need to be able to jump a two-star headquarters into Baghdad. And so, uh, you know, for weeks before, the invasion of, uh, of Iraq, you know, we've got a, actually it was probably right about the size of this, this stage. It was a mock-up of the, of the Baghdad International Airport with every building, everything else, where we're, where we're gonna land, what we're gonna do when we hit the ground, all those kinds of things. So that was the plan if, and, and we weren't gonna jump unless it was semi-permissive to permissive, but that was the plan. Um, if we had, you know, it's like, the original plan was not a fait accompli type thing. And when you think about Taiwan and, and uh, what Russia tried to do in, in, in uh, Kiev, um, they wanted to do a fait accompli, do it so quickly that the, the international community could do nothing about it, right? Um, so that was not the plan for, for uh, our nation going into Iraq. We thought it would take a while, but it was um, kind of the backup plan. What, what, do we, what if we do do something so quickly, we need to get somebody in there quickly? So I, I say that to say, you know, that's not really what happened, right? As, as the Marines and the, the 3rd Infantry Division uh, went up the two big major highways on either side of the Tigris Euphrates, 
lot of um, big cities in the middle that were meant to be bypassed. And then about D plus uh, two, D plus three, a resupply convoy, uh, you know, took a wrong turn and went into Anasaria and had 11 people killed, a bunch of people uh, captured, Jessica Lynch famously captured. And so they said, uh, this is a problem. You know, our mission, we were going to jump into Baghdad. You're not going to do that, obviously. So you guys take your brigade, take a couple other brigades, one from 101st, one from uh, 2nd LCR, and, and take those big cities, Najaf, Nasri, and Samoa. And so, so you know, we uh, it was in a little small um, convoy of as, we, as the uh, two-star headquarters. And we had, and I rode in the ALO's vehicle, right? In other words, the Jag Go with the ALO, because the ALO, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so we've got, you know, the uh, an E6, Air Force E6, and, uh, and, and a Lieutenant Colonel 05, and he's the ALO. And we've had about seven other officers. That's all it was, a very small little thing, one, one tent headquarters uh, that we were going to set up and, and manage those three battles, which we did. Um, but as we, we crossed the berm, I'm kind of, I was squeezed next to this huge, bank of radios that was a Humvee. And uh, this is actually not a picture of, because we were wearing uh, chem suits at the time, because we all thought we were going to get chemmed by, by Saddam at the time. And, you know, which it, we wore for about 10 days and we went about 25 days without a shower. So we were, we were pretty ripe. Uh, but, so, but, uh, you know, I'm sitting next to this huge thing and, and we've got about 20 vehicles in this convoy and we're about in the middle. And um, every once in a while, it, the, 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 the convoy, because we left, you know, at night and we're driving at night, all of a sudden the whole convoy would, would move off the side of the road and, and we had no communications. We could probably talk to a B-52 or Air Force One with all the Air Force communication in that vehicle, but we couldn't talk to anybody in the convoy whatsoever, <laughs> which was really interesting. Um, so, uh, but we would just have to pull over and the, you'd have fuel trucks going by at 80 miles an hour. We're all blackout drive fuel trucks. They're like, they know they can be up there because kind of both armor columns were, were stuck for a few days. So as, as we're stuck for a few days, um, then and then we start to manage these battles uh, for As Nasiriya and Samoa. I don't know if anyone remembers this thing called Falcon View. So Falcon View was an NGA program. It was satellites of the, um, the entire world. And then you'd get disks for certain portions of the world, and they'd update these disks. So it was basically what you see now from Google Maps, but it was before Google Maps. And so I had a little laptop computer, and I could put talk of you in, and I could I could pull up a a, um, a grid a grid square. And but mostly we were using maps, right? One to fifty thousand maps. And so as we're, I think it was the Battle of Nasiriyah or somewhere, I don't remember which, but we get a call. We had one sat phone, um, Iridium sat phone. And so we get a call and, and, and it's somebody from another agency. And they said, hey, I've got eyes on. Uh, we've got about 70 Fedayeen. And if you remember the Fedayeen, the guys weren't black and they were, they were shooting Iraqis in the back if they deserted. And so they, that's why they were fighting. And they just started the idea of IEDs and everything else. But he said, 70 uh, Fedayeen are, are kind of massing here. And he gave us the grid square. And I look at the, we look at the one to 50,000 map and the grid square, uh, when you look at it, it, it looks like a stadium. And so at the time, the rules of engagement stated that there, I, there were four rules of engagement that you had to go to the SECDEF for approval. And it was uh, collateral uh, casualties of 10 civilians or over. Um, if there were human shields being used and if there was destruction of infrastructure, I, I don't remember what the fourth one was. Um, but, you know, like you look at this map and it looks like a stadium and that sounds like infrastructure to me. I'm talking to my CG, but then, so I pull up Falcon view and on Falcon view, you can clearly see it's like a track with some aluminum bleachers. <laughs> and I said, that is not <laughs> infrastructure, aluminum bleachers, no, no way that's. And so we, we prosecuted the target and it, it was, a, it was a great success, but you know, so we don't have live use of space at this point, but we, we've got space still affecting military operations. Okay, so um, let's see. 
just a few more war stories, don't worry. I won't, I won't bother you too much more with these. Uh, actually, I, I don't normally tell stories like this uh, with myself in the center and my family would probably, you're probably learning more about what I've done in Iraq and Afghanistan than my family knows at this point. But when you're given 65 minutes to get, you know, I was like, I gotta fill it with something. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, we, uh, after, after the invasion, we actually went home for a few months, which was good. And then the insurrection starts and, and they call the 82nd headquarters back and we go um, into Western Iraq. And this is, so uh, this picture is actually the Fallujah courthouse. One of the things that we're doing is we go, um, you know, try to get the judges to listen to criminal cases. And of course in 0304, uh, and you can see this is dust. On, 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 the, on the desk there. The judges were seeing no cases. They were doing no cases. They were getting paid. Uh, and so, you know, we'd, we'd go and check on them every once in a while, try to get to do their thing. And in, in 0304, you know, they all said the same thing. Uh, I need a gun, I need a security guard, and I need an armored car. If I have those three things, then maybe I'll start to, you know, prosecute some of these criminal cases uh, because, um, you know, everybody in Iraq is collect is, is is connected to a family, a tribe, a clan, whatever. And of course, in 0809, this is me talking with some other judges, and nothing had really changed. Uh, same thing, uh, a little worse. The, the 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 buildings are now a little worse for wear by 0809. Uh, this is a different town, obviously, um, but the the judges are saying the exact same thing. I need a gun. I need a security guard. I need a stopping car before we'll see any cases. And so, but but what things had changed. Um, so in 0304. We had a couple sat phones. Um, we 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 started to have uh, UAVs, um, and we had UAV coverage of our operations. Uh, you know the important ones. Um, by the t and and you know you got to remember, O three O four um, people had flip phones, but that's about it, right? The the first iPhone was announced in January two thousand seven, and it wasn't rolled out until June of two thousand seven. Um, so it, you come in in 2008, and what you see is it, it, the Iraqi counterparts you're working with, they usually had like, I, don't, I never understood it, they always had like seven or eight flip phones. And so when they, they talked to their different commanders, they had a different phone for everything. Um, but as you flew over uh, Baghdad or you flew over Ramadi, you know, what had changed was every house had some type of satellite dish. You know, in, in 0304, the way we gathered intel, primarily with the assistance of other agencies, was um, people would go to internet cafes, right? The internet cafes, probably people don't even remember what internet cafes are because people didn't have their own internet. You had to go to someplace and pay. And the bad guys had to go to someplace and pay to use the internet as well. And so uh, by uh, 08, 09, um, people have their own access to the internet through these devices that are on tops of their roofs. And so the way you gather intel is very different by that time as well. And of course, um, you know, what also changes by 2008, 2009 is that you start to, um, you start to have a space liaison officer uh, with you uh, and coordinate not, not only for ISR, but then lots of, you know, technical operations um, and the, the idea of pinging phones and what you can do with those kinds of things. So you have a lot of, a lot, a lot of different things you're doing um, you start to incorporate space into by, by 08, 09. Okay, let me just see if I, anything I forgot to talk about here. Okay, so um, from then, I, after a 15 month tour in Iraq, um, I then spent way too much time in the Pentagon. Uh, I was, <laughs> you know, doing things and, and I, you know, thanks again to Chuck Plummer for being here and, and Todd for the opportunity to speak here and everything else. Um, so, uh, doing things like, like, like Chuck was doing last as the DJ, um, and, and then I, you know, got out, like I said, I was doing some other things and I decided, uh, because I was offered an uh, interview with Heather Wilson and to come back to General Collins the Air Force. And I like to say, I just spent four years in the Pentagon, you know, back to back and Pentagon is the last place I want to be, but it's kind of the old saying, if you want to make. God laughed, tell them your plans, right? So <laughs> it had to be God's plan because the last, last place I want to go is the Pentagon. But at the time, I thought we were going to war in Korea, if you remember that, the three-point stance and moving all the ammunition and, and really thought we were going to war to Korea. So I thought, you know, might as well go to where, where that is. 
Um, so what I want to talk about now is kind of the things I learned uh, being in the Air Force uh, as the Air Force General Counsel. And, and so, um, you know, this is really pixelated. This is what happens. And Jeremy warned me. Thank you, Jeremy, also for all your support. Jeremy warned me. It's going to be, it's pretty pixelated. And it's pixelated on my laptop, frank, frank, frankly, here. It's really pixelated. It's an F-15. <laughs> this is what happens when you have a Luddite army guy, you know, knuckle-dragging army guy trying to do his own slides. Uh, so, uh, um, so an F-15. So the F-15 is been in 104 dogfights where there's been a winner and loser. It's 104 to zero. That's pretty darn good. You know, many of those are in the Middle East, right? Uh, with our partners, uh, Israel, many, many of them are Israeli kills. 104 to zero, the F-15. The F-15 um, in mock fights, and I don't know if this is still true, but I heard stories when I was the Air Force General Counsel, you know, against an F-22 or F-35, they have these mock fights. And the 104 to zero F-15 has never defeated an F-22. Um, you know, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, when I, and, you know, the F-22 and F-2035, they have this thing called stealth technology. And so as an army guy, kind of a ground person, I always thought stealth, that means that's good because they won't be seen by radar as they come in, they can bomb stuff for us, right? Air Force Force doesn't really care about that. If you talk to pilots, they don't care about that at all. What the F-15 does, right? It has a forward looking radar and you want to be able to see your, the other guy before they see you and you want to have a longer range, you want to have overmatch on your weapons, right? If you, they can, you can see them with your radar before they see you, and then you can shoot them before they can shoot you, and then you've got to kill. Stealth just means that they're not going to see you with that forward-looking radar, right? So you're going to be able to get inside their envelope, you're going to be able to shoot, and they're not going to see you. That's, and we spent billions of dollars on stealth technology, right? Um, not, not what I thought at all, what it was about. So, why is that important? So that's really important when you start to think about this, ready for another really pixelated view, um, what's called an OV-1, right? So, <laughs> yeah, you can't see that. That's all right. It, it doesn't need to be seen. It's actually better that it's like this. <laughs> so um, the, the idea is, right, JADC2, you guys all heard that, join all domain command and control. Join all domain command and control. What it means is a little bit what we heard yesterday, Uber for artillery. So we're all used to this thing now. And we're used to the fact that you could call for Uber and you have, and it'll say, it, it, used, it doesn't do this anymore. I wish it would, right? It would say this, this vehicle has four stars and it's five minutes away. This vehicle has five stars and it's six minutes away. And you could pick the six star guy or the five star guy, even though he's six minutes away. Now it just gives you one choice, but it used to have choices, right? And, and so what it was doing, it was aggregating data from Google Maps and traffic. And where does Google Maps get its data? It's aggregating data from police reports, from everybody who's feeding into it, um, and from, from things on the side of the road. And so it's aggregating huge amounts of data and then processing that all with AI, right? That's, that's what it's doing. Now, that's one thing we don't do really well in the Department of Defense, or what we didn't do in the Department of Defense very well, because you have a lot of stovepipe data. Everybody's different. Within the Army, there's stovepipes. Within the Navy, there's stovepipes. Within the Air Force. And then between the services, there's huge stovepipes. So if you could actually get all this data together, you know, in the middle of the South Pacific, if you try to get an Uber, it, you know, just because of the sensors there, you wouldn't get much. But if you could actually fuse all these sensors, and then if you bring satellites into it and you... Uh, proliferated Leo constellation, all that data. And you could fuse it together quick enough, process it with AI quick enough. Um, it doesn't matter if you have stealth technology, right? You're gonna, you're gonna be able to see a plane flying to you even though you can't see it with your forward looking radar. You're gonna see it from, you're gonna see every plane all the time, everywhere and know exactly what it is. And if you have quantum computing, I, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but and there, I think there are some Navy guys here, but with quantum computing, the amount of data you can process in quantum computing, you could probably do the same things. You, you could probably even detect submarines um, just because of little tells that submarines give if you could power enough data and process enough data. 
So think about the implications of that. And so, you know, that, that's why JADC2 is so important for us as a, as, as a military, as a nation. And, and I think it's why, uh, and, and I was there as, you know, the, the president said, we're gonna create a space force. And so we started to do that. And you had a lot of people who said, you know, not on my watch, but the Air Force, we hold space and we're not gonna give it up and, you know, and, and so obviously a good compromise position to make it a kind of the Marine Corps model, make it a, a service under the Department of the Air Force, you're not really losing it. But it, more important that it was a realization that everything that we do today is dependent on space and everything we do tomorrow will be even more dependent on space. And so uh, there was a recognition in the Air Force leadership and in the Joint Chiefs um, that you've got to get this done, right? You, you, that, um, that there are going to be some benefits despite the bureaucracy. The first thought was the bureaucracy of standing up a new service. And so obviously, uh, I love the fact that the Space Force flag is over here. Space Command stood up itself or restood itself up. It had been, you know, um, uh, put aside and then brought back up, but uh, the Space Force created. And so. Um, and that's the, <laughs> you know who that is, right? That's the next list series. I bring that up because one of the things that, uh, Secretary Wilson, um, you know, she said, all right, you, you headquarter the team, general counsel, if you headquarter the team to write the legislation and the old saying that success has a thousand fathers and failure is an orphan. And so there's obviously lots of people who were involved and without the president Bush, without the vice president, you know, being very involved and, and administrating most of it, but then without the joint chiefs getting involved, uh, without all the help of DOD, um, you know, the space force wouldn't happen. But I, so the, the good thing about um, all this is I, I got to know Jay Raymond very well. He, his office is right next to mine after he got, he moved inside the, the glass doors and uh, legislative liaison on the other side. But he used to uh, he used to say, those guys in Netflix, they're watching me because my office, like the, the things that are in the background in the office, in his office, are, are the stuff that's in my office. <laughs> so he said, I'm kind of freaked out about that. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, again, I kind of talked about why I think there was a change in, in, in leadership view on the, the Space Force. But I think Heather Wilson said it best in, in a small way. She's, and as we're talking to people, particularly on the Hill and five-time congressmen, she was great about talking about this kind of stuff. But it's, we built glass houses in a world without stones. So we, we need to move forward, right? Um, the other thing happened that convinced quite a few congressmen, there were classified briefings in, in the Pentagon. We'd bring over Congress people to classified briefings so they could and, um, you know, obviously not going to give you the details of those, but a big part of those was, here's what China order of battle will be in terms of anti-satellite technologies and other technologies by the year 2030 at the rate they're spending. And at the rate we're spending, um, we're not going to be able to match them, right? And so you don't, and, and so that's, you know, the, the thing about a service is, right, a service is about really fighting for the money and strategic decisions on acquisition projects. And it, it's, it's not about actually, you know, what a space camp does is it employs the forces, it requests forces from a service, but the service has to build those forces up and they have to uh, fight for those services or fight for those uh, resources. And um, which, you know, my experience on the Army staff and the Air Force staff is, the Air Force staff really concentrates on that much better uh, than the Army staff does. The Army very much looks down and in on the Army as the Army staff. The Air Force is very much focused upon um, fighting for resources and across the, across the river, and they do it really well. So uh, one, one of my kind of key takeaways from the differences in, in culture there between the Army and the, and the Air Force, at least at the staff level. So uh, this is, uh, does anybody know who this is? It's Frank Luke. Frank, so everyone's heard of Eddie Rickenbacker. Eddie Rickenbacker is the, um, the, the second most kills by an airman uh, in World War I. And so Frank Luke, he had 18 kills, nine of them were balloons. So think about that. <laughs> and, and actually, so our recent balloon gate uh, incident, uh, the, the F-22s went after him, their call signs were Frank one and Frank two. <laughs> so after uh, Frank Luke. Um, and, but I, I bring him up because as we went and talked to congressmen, 
I, they wanted to talk about the creation, uh, you know, is, should this be different than the creation of the Air Force? And, and my thought was absolutely, right? Because creation of the Air Force happened in 1947. If you, before that, I mean, there was a Department of War and a Department of Navy. Those are two departments. So when they created the Air Force, they created a Department of Defense. They made the Army the Department of the Army. Um, they created a Joint Staff and they created the Air Force. Right, it completely, you know, a rejiggering. So I, I said, let's look back at World War One, because the fact that you know some of his half his kills were balloons, and World War One. The, um, the the Germans were actually bombing London in World War One. I mean, everyone knows about the Blitz in World War Two, but over four thousand civilians were killed in World War One in London. And that was sometimes by Zeppelins and sometimes by long range Gotha bombers. And so, um, so what it, was the response of the British to that? And they created the RAF in 1918. And the creation of the RAF, right? Then they made some, because they had a service who was focused on that, the RAF in those interwar period made some really good strategic acquisition decisions and R&D decisions. They made a decision to put go whole hog into radar, right? And if you think about what one battle of Britain, it was probably more than anything, it was radar. And they were far ahead of anybody else on radar development. Uh, and then they also made a decision on the Spitfire, you know, what the a, a plane that was built for defense of that island and, and a great plane. So what did the army do? And I say army because it was the army who was who was making decisions about the Army Air Corps in the interwar period. It made a decision to go with heavy bombers and short range fighters. And they decided, you know, if we put enough machine guns outside of a, a super fortress or a fortress, then they'll be able to defend themselves. They don't need fighter escort. That was, and, and you know, they did some good things too, but that was a big strategic decision. And what did that strategic decision resolve in? That, that and, and daytime bombing, which they wanted to have because they wanted precision bombing and they created a Northern site, Northern bomb site, and that's great. Um, but that dis, the strategic decision resulted in the fact that the Eighth Air Force, uh, um, there were more casualties than the entire Marine Corps in the Pacific. And you can look it up, I'm not lying. <laughs> you know, because eight person, they, like 5,000, bomber shot out of the sky, normally an eight person, eight person crew on a bomber. So um, not, if you don't have somebody who is focused on that domain, you're probably not gonna make really good decisions. Um, and, and that's what a service should do. They should be, and, and my worry is, you know, sometimes uh, the, the, and this will come, I think with time, but I think right now the Space Force in my mind, some of the decisions they're making, they're making still on a two to three year horizon. They're not thinking as a service should about a 15 or a 20 year horizon. Um, and so I think they need to do that better. And, you know, I would say that to anybody. I, I you know, obviously Salty is a big thinker and, and I think he is trying to do that, but um, the whole service needs to, to do that better. Let me transition. You don't have to hear any more war stories. <laughs> let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, shout out to Maxar here. You know, we, we talked about this, but what's, what's, what's changed, right? So in, let's see, um, 2011, NASA, if you went to, to space with the space shuttle, in 2011, it cost you $30,000 per pound to put something into space. Uh, in 2021 with SpaceX, it cost $1,200 per pound. A huge difference, right? And that's why you have now satellite spiking, because you can actually get there, the cost of launch. So what did, what did NASA do? They said, we, you know, we've been building this stuff. You look at the post office, probably not a good idea for the, uh, the United States government to do anything like build big things, <laughs> cross overruns, there's everything else, right? So, so they said, we want to have launch as a service. And so they, um, they, they put it out there. Um, they actually said they were gonna fund about 85% of the cost of that. And so that's how we got to Blue Origin and SpaceX and ULA, you know, competing for this launch as a service. NASA said, we're going to pay 85% of the, the pre-booking of the launch that you do. 
and, um, and that it motivated them to develop these programs and, uh, and, and create you know, the miracle that we have now in space and, and the proliferation of satellites happens now uh, because of that decision in that program. So, um, and lots of implications and I'll talk more about that. Uh, but so this is our star lab or a, a vision of our star lab. And um, so right now what NASA has done and we can talk more about Artemis and other things, but one of the programs NASA is doing is they've said, let's do space station as a service, right? Let's do, let's do the same thing. What we're gonna do rather than the government uh, partnering with the Russians and the ISS, we need to have a replacement space station. The space station uh, certainly should decommission by, uh, originally was gonna be um, 2023 and now it's out, extended out to 2030 is the plan, but let's, let's have uh, our own space station. And they've said that they're gonna just um, fund about 15% of it. And because, and, and even before we won the contract from NASA, we thought we have a commercial uh, need we we through agri research, farmer research, and other things. We think there's enough pre-booking. Uh, people want to be able to do experimentation at a space station in Leo that we'll be able to build a space station, even when we didn't have that 15% of backing that NASA uh, said that they'll pay us. So that's that's kind of where where we are in the next step. Um, you know, obviously, uh, we think that as you've got the other programs, you know, this will be important to cislunar and lunar and, and beyond lunar, uh, because you're going to have to test things out uh, in LEO before you can do that, um, do those other missions. And so getting, getting there by 2028, very important. And so the other thing I would say is, you know, you saw the huge thing that's the huge change in satellite launches. That, when you think about the analogy to elevators, so let me just, in 1870 in New York was a, you know, everything in New York City was at six floors. Cause that was probably about, no one wants to climb more than six flights of stairs. And you had the invention of the elevator, it was a steam elevator. And so um, you got to an eight floor building in 1870 with the first elevator in New York City. Uh, in 1885, you had a 10 floor uh, building built in Chicago. Between 1895 and the 20s, you start to use hydraulics rather than steam, and the ability goes up. And once you have that ability to go up, you know, the skyline of New York changes. Things change. And I think the same thing is true. You know, what we expect to be doing in commercial space in Leo and beyond, now that we can get there, it's, we're just seeing the beginning of that. And so I think that uh, that'll, that'll continue. You know, our, our CEO talks about, he sees, and he's been to space. So he, he said his experience in space was what hit him was you get into space, you recognize that the earth, everything else is kind of natural. The earth is really unnatural. We're protected in this dome by our atmosphere. Everything else is really cold, nasty, and harsh. And so we need to do more to protect that, that uh, unnatural environment we have here on earth. And so if we could move all manufacturing, if we could move all energy generation, um, to space and we can project that energy in and we can, you know, earth becomes more of a Shangri-La than it is uh, once we move all that. And so I think that, that is where the future is. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, more pixelated pictures, but um, so, you know, when I think about the, the possibilities for future commercial space, as I said, before it was all governments and nation states who were in space. And that's the opposite of what we normally see, right? We normally see commerce go into an area and then nation states follow. So whether it's trappers, and of course trappers have to worry about individuals, bandits, things like that, armed groups, people who think, or in, in, in this case, obviously had a better right to the land than they did, right? Um, uh, armed groups like Native Americans, um, but, and then you have nation states, you know, Detroit, D Detroit uh, you know, the French, uh, there was a battle for the land there. And so you had and discoveries of gold in the South Hills or in California. And so you had people go, people be, then need protection. 
right? Because the commerce drove the government to then protect. A um, little bit the opposite here, right? You've got nation states over there. Now you're 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 uh, you're going forward um, with commerce, and then East India Company, right? The East India Company. Um, so kind of similar with launch, you know, launch. Uh, the, the cost of launch was getting out to the East Indies, right? And they had to, they decided if you give us a monopoly government, then we will arm ourselves, we will protect ourselves and, um, and, and you allow us to do that. So they gave them special status to then do that, right? Because the cost of getting there and back. And of course that started in the 1600s, late 1500s and through the 1700s, um, that, that's the way it worked. But eventually it, the, the trade became so important to the government that the East India Company and the British government kind of became indistinguishable in many ways. So just, just a thought there. Okay, I'm gonna go quickly through this so I can get to questions. I like to say um, the Chinese already have a space station. Maybe we should have one. So uh, of course the Chinese, they're, they're still haunted, but they call their century of humiliation. They wanna be technologically um, in the lead rather in the van. And so um, they have a, a space station up there. They've had three people on it continuously for a while now. Um, interesting, you know, one of the guys on our team says they're going to have a, a telescope that's 350 times larger than Hubble and capable, but what looks out can look down, right? Um, so I think that this is not surprising that every astronaut who's been in there for the Chinese has been a member of the, of the PLA. Uh, probably true in our early days in space as well, but it is interesting. Um, and, I, and I do wonder, you know, other than saying they want to be a premier technological country, if there was some military capability that made them think that you know, they should make this type of um, outlay of expenses and funds. Question that I'd love to ask some people <laughs> if they know if the Chinese had, a, had a, a military case for having a commercial space station. And then, uh, you know, again, here's, here's more of what they've done. Here's what's concerning to us and concerning the blue, I'm sure, and concerning North Grumman, all of this in the commercial space station business, because they're already in operation uh, and should be concerning to us as a nation. So they've already got 46 agreements uh, with 19 countries and four international agencies to include ESA, European Space Agency, and some of our you know, best partners, Japan, Italy, France, Germany. Um, so they're already working with the Chinese on this space station. So I, I think that's a, a concerning um, tidbit. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna wrap up so we can get to questions, but let me, let me just talk some implications here as I see them um, from all this stuff that I threw on the wall that maybe some of it stick. So obviously, parochial implications for us of Voyager Space, um, we do think, you know, every time I hear General Raymond speak, his first question is, why do the robots get to have all the fun? When are we gonna have guardians in space, right? I do think that there is a case um, that for uh, the Space Force to get into the space station business. And I, because it's crawl, walk, run, right? They're gonna eventually, they're gonna have to be on the moon and beyond. And so you're gonna need to start to do some experimentation and Leo is a perfect place to do that. Uh, whether, you, whether it's bones and medical research and everything else, what it's gonna do to astronauts and airmen uh, and guardians. So that's, that's a piece. I think there's also an interesting thought, and others have brought this up to me, that, right, it would, particularly when you look at a fait accompli strategy um, and at Taiwan, right, they've seen the way we undid the playbook in Ukraine. And so at least 72 hours before, they might want to start to take down SATCOM, ISR, uh, and, and GPS capabilities by dazzling and degrading and doing other things, right? But if you have backup capabilities in a, in a crude craft, you know, wouldn't that be probably more near an act of war? So could you stop their playbook by having a crude craft with backup capabilities for all those things? Um, then there's also kind of logistics at the edge. Uh, there's a lot of talk of ISAM. Uh, of course, um, Clay Mowry and our team says, you know, the answer to every question in space 
the space debris and space uh, refueling and everything else, the answer to every question is space tugs. It's like, <laughs> that, that is, so, you know, space tugs would solve a lot of things, but, you know, the idea that you could have a location where you're doing in-space manufacture as well, so you can fix things once you have that space tug as well, um, or depots, uh, a place where you can launch things Reproliferate when things are being taken out. So I think that's a that's something that's that's obviously being thought about. The things we talked about a lot yesterday: uh, implications on dual use, kind of Starlink, and um, you know what Maxor is doing, and and Satcom, and web capabilities. Um, so they're, they're, to me, clearly dual use, and they're targetable. Uh, but then what does that mean for indemnification, war insurance, and what does it mean for uh, protect and defend. Does, should there be an ability to protect and defend? And I'll talk about, I'll close with a little story about World War I real quick uh, at the end of this. But, um, you know, is that fighters? Is it individual defense of satellites? Uh, or is it maybe there's some, it came World War II and a convoys across the Atlantic. There's some ability to, to, to recreate that. Um, so, and then implications for compatibility. Again, debris removal and refueling, uh, as I've heard, we can't have a Huawei moment in space, right? If we went to 4G to 5G, 4G US was all over the international um, bodies that governed uh, use of, of that type of technology and ensured that our technology was adopted worldwide. And in 5G, right, there was a battle between low band and high band. And Chinese went one way, we went the other, and they started to win over folks in Europe and other places, right? So if, if someone says and demands a certain um, standard, right, that, and if it, it's the Chinese and they get ahead of us, it, whether it's for refueling or, or um, the orbiting and everything else, you know, we could, we could be in a bad place. Having a, a first mover advantage in that is, is really important, so. Um, okay, the other thing, obviously, I've said it again, but commerce is growing in space. And so uh, what business wants is predictability and um, stability. So this whole alphabet soup, FAA for launch and FCC for communications, NOAA for sensing and, you know, Space Force now, but eventually commerce for, um, for traffic management and SSA. So we need to kind of, the National Space Council, I think, needs to figure out, you know, a, a coherent um, way that we can all think about um, regular, regulatory schemes for the future. And then uh, the other big implication to me is, you know, as I said, eventually energy generation, manufacturing, I think, and so it's not just mineral resources being pulled out from different things, and special mineral resources and special energy, but I think all that will eventually move to space, right? Um, and and in the shorter term, big data will probably move to space as well, right? And so when that all moves to space, uh, and big data is the new oil, you know, the the wars of the past forty years have been fought about. Really, someone would say about oil and where oil is, or keeping stable where oil comes from, because our economies all rely on that. So. Uh, uh, with that, the implications for that in the future is important too. So bring up World War I again. Um, so how many people have heard of Roland Garros? Right, Garros tennis players, right? The Garros Center. Roland Garros, he was, he was a French pilot. Um, so 1908, the first military contract for, for an aircraft, um, the Wright Flyer Three flew over Fort Myer right above the Pentagon. And, you know, the, the, the tail was still in front of the wings in 1908, right? And $25,000 contract. 1911, Roland Garros, first person to fly across the Mediterranean in airplane. 1914, the war kicks off, right? 19, by 1915, Roland Garros had three kills. And in his third kill, he had determined, you know, he was sick of not being able to shoot straight at people. So he put pieces of metal around the bottom of his blades and he, and he mounted a machine gun in the middle. And you know, it said that 93% um, of the bullets got through. I don't know where those other 7% went, but <laughs> so, um, but he, 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 sh he made his third kill. He got shot down over German lines and uh, the Germans 
looked at it. You know, they're like, this guy's really successful. They looked at it. And so then a Dutch um, airplane designer, Fokker, looked at it and said, oh, we can do better than this. And he designed an interrupting chain. So every time you fire, the blades would stop and shoot, right? And so that became the Fokker. And of course, you know, then British aircraft and American aircraft and, and World War I and the rest of the, the war were called Fokker fodder because the Fokkers were so good because they had this forward looking uh, machine gun. And, you know, the, the best line of, of anything, you know, when a, when a British pilot would finally get behind a Fokker and say, oh, I've got that Fokker in my sights. But, <laughs> but um, so, uh, but it, Roland Garros comes back, he, he escapes from POW camp. And in 1917, 1918, he shoots down two more aircraft and then he's killed uh, after shooting down his fifth. And that's where the, the ace of five kills comes really from Roland Garros. But to me, what's amazing to that is, right, it's, it's the, that short timeline when you have the entire will, the survival of nations at stake, how much resources are going to be poured into an effort and how quickly technology is going to advance. I mean, that's 1907. Now, you know, I'm not that far away. Even, again, I'm old. Uh, my grandfather uh, was an Italian immigrant, uh, and he was in a he was in an Austrian POW camp. He's in the Italian army. He just say "Tredici mesi, Tredici mesi." Thirteen months he spent in an Austrian camp. So we're not that far away from one. But at the same time, you know, the technology is very far away. But the quickness with the, which they closed those gaps and graded things, how quickly, if there is a war in space, how quickly things will change the space. I think we're not ready for. Um, and I think we have to thank them. So with that, I think I'll take some questions. Maybe get 10 minutes or so. Hey, Tom, you talked a little bit about how progression and development in space, at least for the United States, appears to have proceeded unilaterally through much of your career, uh, though certainly there's been a lot of cooperation in space. I was struck by your example about how China is signing deals with a lot of our close allies. Do you have any thoughts on how we can counter that type of Chinese influence? What's the path forward for the United States and for the Space Force to ensure we've got strong allies in space? Yeah, so I forget what diplomats said it, but you know, in some meeting of you know Chinese and Russians and us and you know, the, some Russian diplomat said, oh, you guys have all the good allies. <laughs> so, and, and we really do, right? So I think that the fact that uh, we all believe in the rule of law, the fact that we all believe in some sense of honor, the, the fact that we sign an agreement, we're actually gonna abide by it um, is really determinative. Um, and so that we've got folks who wanna work with us, you know, more than they wanna work with the Chinese is really important. So I think we just need to, we need to provide them the outlets Right, uh, you know, medical research. Talk about in space assembly and manufacture. ISAM, you know, retinas is a multi-billion-dollar industry. Um, if you can replace retinas, and of course, when you try to grow retina in, down here on the ground, um, not only gravity but the forces uh, that you don't have in Leo, where things will grow perfectly symmetrically, you could grow these retinas. So, so we have so many use cases. And so many, and people recognize that if you can start to do these in space, not only experimentation, you know, beyond, it's good we have first mover advantage with things like mRNA technology, but if we could, people were fired up to, to benefit from space research and manufacturing, but if their only option is China, then they're going to go there because it's about the bottom line, right? So we have to provide them, we have to be just quicker about it, so. I don't know if that ends. Thanks, Quincy, for that question. Sir, we have a question from uh, Peter Masterton, who is viewing virtually. He asks, sir, in your view, what should the U.S. do if a foreign actor, for example, the Russians, uh, actually does start to attack U.S. commercial satellites? So um, that's a question better for Lori. <laughs> Can somebody who, uh, no, but I think it is, it's, it's a, uh, you know what's the harm, right? Is is it is it an act of of, of war? Is it an act of force? Um, what are the consequences? Uh, so I I am interested in the, in the classified session for those of us who will be there um, to see what the Russians have been doing. 
Uh, and I think it is very analogous to cyber at this point. I think eventually it won't be analogous to cyber, but for now, I think it's analogous to cyber. Um, so I, I think you just have to look at the consequences and, and, and figure out if you know, they've crossed a red line for our national security interests. And I think, I think it would be good, right? Um, so it is interesting. I think the Russians did that ASAT test in November. I think that was on their pre-invasion checklist to send a message to us, right? There are certain things that they were gonna do before they invaded in February. And one of them was send a message, don't mess with us in space. Um, and, and so I think it is interesting though, to think about, can we like nuclear, right? I, I don't think it's the end of conventional wars, it, even maybe even a conventional war that's really big and dirty. Obviously Ukraine has proven that, but can you draw lines around nuclear? Can you draw lines around space and have people respect that? Let's hope so. That would be great because you know, our daily life relies on that blue dot. And so uh, I think if you have one attack in space, it's gonna, it's gonna avalanche pretty quickly. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, so uh, uh, I'm the commander's advocate of a, obviously an army unit um, and we have a space company. Uh, so with that preface, my, my question is, how do you see the evolution of the space domain uh, in relation to like all the services, like how is everyone supposed to, to play together in space essentially? It's a good question. Um, and I know that, you know, the army, uh, when I was general company of the Air Force, I had lots of heated conversations with the army G3 because they did not want to move their assets to the space force. They, you know, you, you want to control what you can control. But I think, uh, again, having expertise in a domain, you've got to let the experts, uh, and I think eventually there also there's going to have to be a roles and missions study, uh, and probably by Congress to do it right because the Marines have an air force. They also have a helicopter force. Uh, the, the Navy has an air force. Uh, the Air Force has an air force. <laughs> you know the Army has helicopter force. Um, so we still haven't even figured it out for a force that was decided in 1947. So I think this will this will take a long way to play out. Um, but that's okay, it, you know, so that friction is good. Uh, so, and I think some redundancy is good too. Yeah. Sir, another online question from uh, Adrian Times. Uh, this is a somewhat of a follow-up to Peter's previous question, but in your most recent capacity in the private sector, right? Perhaps something that you could speak to. Uh, Adrian asks, with respect to US commercial companies, what do you think they should possibly do independent, right, of any U.S. government protection or, right, law of war kind of considerations uh, if indeed they start to be attacked by foreign actors? What should they do to protect themselves? Yeah, so I, I think everything in space takes a long time, right? So um, the fact that any commercial company would start to think about defending themselves in space the timeline for that, the cost of that uh, is probably prohibitive unless they're told to do something. Uh, you, you know, a commercial space, uh, space company, again, we're trying to build a $2 billion piece of equipment, right? And we're trying to get the advanced contracts for astronaut space um, and the advanced contracts for farmer research and agri research and other things. Uh, and so, and, and we've got a case, we're going to build that. But then if someone said, Oh, you need to put the equivalent of a, a deck cannon, you know, on on your uh, on your space station. Um, number one, do we want to enter that dual use? You know, there's kind of the law of war question, and then there's the cost question. So, so I think that um, it's not likely that commercial companies, unless they're like specifically and almost unilaterally you know, single focused on being defense contractors, that would would be willing to do that. So, all right. Get the hook. Right. Thank you very much. For, uh, very much appreciate you being here with us today. And uh, also thank you very much for your many years of service to our nation in so many different capacities. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and it's been a real treat for us. So great. Thank Thanks. you very much.